What's going on guys? So the topic of today's video is going to be kind of a relook at an article that I wrote in 2016, but there's kind of a timing element to this. There's been a kind of another event that I thought um, kind of sparked us looking at this again. And the topic we're going to be talking about is legacy brands within sports nutrition and nutritional supplements. And the article that I'm kind of referencing is something around the lines of legacy brands rarely being relevant in the market again. And kind of what I want to do is kind of take a look at maybe how things have changed, maybe things, uh, maybe things haven't changed, um, just kind of where I think things are going wrong with legacy brands in this category of products. Hopefully give some information and insight that you guys would appreciate. Before I get into this video, would love if you guys hit the thumbs up button. That supports me, that helps me out a ton. Also helps YouTube understand that you guys are gaining value out of these videos. That helps them kind of spread it out to more people and helps me grow this channel more. The more I can grow this channel, the more people I can help. Um, and that's the ultimate goal with this channel. But let's talk about kind of the timing element of why I wanted to put this video together. So originally I was gonna put a video together probably four or five months ago. Um, I did do a short podcast segment uh, on the Stacked or Fitness Informant podcast at the time uh, around the EAS uh, closures. The, um, the legacy sports nutrition brand, EAS, um, Abbott Laboratories, the uh, big pharmaceutical conglomerate, um, did close the EAS sports nutrition brand um, in, I think, July, maybe June or July of uh, 2018. And that was kind of shuttered like abruptly for most people, I think. Um, there was still a lot of sell through that was happening from food, drug, mass convenience channels, um, though the brand was not extremely relevant anymore. So that was obviously like a shockwave, but something that happened a few weeks ago, um, Champion Nutrition, which is now owned by Clorox, um, if you guys don't know kind of the backstory, Champion Nutrition was owned by Nutrinex, which owns a couple other brands like Rainbow Light. Um, they were acquired by Clorox in, I think almost about a year ago, I think in March of 2018. And basically Clorox decided that this brand didn't really fit into their plans or how they kind of saw that portion of their business and they kind of decided to close that. So Champion Nutrition is closed, EAS closed. These are both within the last you know half a year, a little bit over a half a year. So obviously two big legacy brands that have been around for a long time have closed. And I think a lot of people are a little bit confused. What's happening? Is this gonna continue to happen? I think at this point in kind of this ultra competitive environment of sports nutrition, nutritional supplement, a lot of people are confused. A lot of people are trying to find answers. This is a difficult environment to you know, kind of find your growth and kind of sustain your growth. Brand life cycles, product life cycles are retracting. When you see names like them, you know, once very big brands in the industry have been around for decades, close, it creates a certain feeling with people in the industry. And I touched on this in the article and kind of continue to focus on this. I have had the opportunity to work for you know, several legacy brands in the last couple of years. Legacy brands have always been kind of a soft spot for me. I don't necessarily know why. I'm not one of those kind of like renovation persons or need to fix things or whatever. I just, when somebody's lost their way um, and I kind of can see a pretty clear picture I want to try to help those people, you know, dig out of it. So I actually had the chance to talk to Nutrinex when they did own the uh, champion name back in late 2016. Talked over several months over a bunch of different ideas and projects and, and different things. And ultimately what happened is what happened more times than not when I'm talking to legacy, um, legacy businesses is that they're not interested in hearing the truths that I'm telling them. They're not interested in putting in the work to, to actually change the trajectory of their business. A lot of that is just way outside of the scope of what they understand or what they wanna do now. It ends up kind of falling on deaf ears. Not that I'm pointing to that scenario because I wanna say like, oh, if they would've listened to me, they wouldn't be in this situation. Um, you know, when the Clorox deal went down, that completely changed any dynamics, anything I had in my plans, I would've had to completely change the way that I looked at everything. So anything that I, you know, particularly put together uh, a year before that acquisition would have completely changed uh, if we're looking at it, you know, right now and why they closed today. So I don't want to, I don't want it to seem like, you know, haha, champion, you should have listened to me. That's definitely not the case. Um, though they probably would have benefited from a lot of things that I said, because I did pay attention over the last couple of years. I saw a lot of those things kind of coming to light that was kind of talked about, but let's shift out of that name. Let's shift into kind of the big topic of this video of like why legacy brands are dying and why are they struggling like what's happening and 
is there some ability for them to change things? And I guess it's important for me to take a step back and just explain to you guys maybe my definition of legacy brands. It's a little bit different than what you'll see if you kind of look it up on, you know, if you Google it and what different people say about legacy brands. My idea of a legacy brand is that it was kind of a once uh, a once a market leader for one reason or another had lost its relevance or kind of cool factor within the industry. It's kind of been in business for a little bit over 10 years. So that's probably a little bit different than some other categories that have been longer standing. Sports nutrition is a very young category still. So I put that kind of 10 year rank on that because brands that have been around for 10 years, those, those are actually few and far between. So um, it's a good kind of a good number to kind of say if something's a legacy brand or not. But why are these legacy brands struggling? And I think my definition in itself maybe is a little bit telling. Um, you know, obviously these brands have lost their clout and relevance in the market. They've been around for a while. So a lot of the things that are happening with brand life cycles and product life cycles are kind of counteracting with just the nature of legacy brands. So that's one thing to consider, but I can name a bunch of different reasons maybe why uh, legacy brands are rarely ever relevant again, but I'm gonna kind of focus on five of them that I kind of think maybe are the most valuable to you guys or most insightful. So let's start at number one. The way that these legacy brands, these businesses are capitalized in their later stages are kind of creating a lot of the problems within matching it up now with the competitive environment that sports nutrition is. This could be in two directions, and this is more than like the two scenarios that are most applicable to legacy brands. So you have one where private equity money comes in, private equity then runs the business very tight, runs it operationally focused, um, value extraction, which they ultimately probably kill a lot of the R&D, they kill a lot of the risk. Um, they basically you know, kind of take out a lot of the layers and try to create as much uh, return as they can, which is not necessarily beneficial in the current environment. And then the other side, like through merger and acquisition with like large strategic, like we're talking about with like Abbott Labs or, or Clorox, generally those strategic throw it right into their distribution networks, their established retail um, relationships. They get a lot of value out of putting them in kind of everywhere, the food, drug, mass, convenience channels. And they have these like large scale operational synergies. Um, they have a lot of different shared employees and, and ability to cut out layers of costs, which is great and all, but again, they can't really innovate anymore because they are stuck in merchandising cycles and having to, you know, secure slots within large retailers. And there's kind of just a, you know, set it and forget it type of an attitude that happens a lot of times with these large strategics. The other side of it is like, from a decision making and innovation and quickness uh, aspect that need that is needed in today's market those companies have a lot of bureaucracy they have a lot of struggle to get things done very quickly just because of the way that they're organized um, so these things are just kind of counterintuitive to the things that uh, you need to do to be effective in today's market number two they're having i mean these legacy brands are struggling to um, capture the biggest buying group right now millennials the for most sports nutrition companies, usually the pie in the sky, the, the people that you want to attract to your brand, they're struggling to find traction with that generational buying group. This comes down to a lot of different reasons with millennials. Millennials are very complex buying group. I won't go into a thesis about that, but millennials tend to have a lack of trust when it comes to like establishment or legacy brands. Um, this just kind of happens with a lot of different categories. This happened um, primarily um, because of a lot of them kind of growing up with the Great Recession and, and different things with banking, having to bail out different big legacy industries, just kind of trickled down into brands a lot of times at this point. I think these legacy brands also don't communicate effectively within the mediums that millennials and younger people associate with. So they're not necessarily really focused on activating through through social media or digital. Um, they're really not utilizing a lot of those um, types of communication or marketing. And because of that, a lot of the product, a lot of the marketing efforts that they are doing really is kind of trying to appeal to everything to everyone, which is kind of how the brand is built in the first place. Legacy brands have always been kind of built on this aspect of try to appeal to everybody. That's how they've survived for so long in kind of an earlier stage of kind of consumer behavior. So number three, we have Honestly, if, if these brands, even from 10 years ago, if they went and hibernated, woke up today, the competitive landscape would be completely different. It'd be completely foreign to what they understood 10 years ago. 
Um, this is because of total proliferation of brand creation, barriers of entry being extremely low now, and barriers of entry from all aspects, from distribution, getting products listed direct to consumer, uh, marketing, social media, all those types of things. So competitive landscape is totally different at this point. Within every category that these legacy brands compete in, you know, there's thousands of products um, that are like them, that are maybe a lot more focused in their marketing efforts. And that's kind of a problem that I kind of alluded to earlier. Being that these brands kind of want to try to appeal everybody by kind of doing everything, they don't have any legs to stand on in marketing. They don't really have any aspect of targeting because they don't really know who their customer is at this point. Though these brands have been around for a long time and you might think to yourself like, man, they have all this rich history. Obviously there's a lot of trust, brand equity in the, in the business. Today's consumer is really kind of focused towards this idea of like, what have you done for me lately? It's not really built around like, you know, we were around since 1970 something. Like, honestly, a lot of consumers could care less. They're really about finding products that are focused towards them through the digital channel. Discoverability is a really big thing with millennials right now with trying to find things that are personalized, kind of creating this buying habit that is geared towards discovering new things. And the number four I kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier about the digital channel. These legacy brands, they've always been a B2B brand. They've never been a you know, B2C. They've never had to do these direct to consumer websites. They've never had to directly communicate to their customers in a way that's meaningful to create, um, to create a story, create buy-in, create an emotion within the buyer that makes them want the brand to be a part of their lives. They haven't really had to do any of that because that really wasn't how brands approach things prior to you know, the emergence of the digital channel and digital marketing and all those types of things. And the way that brands are getting built today, more quantitatively in terms of you know, digital marketing, really understanding algorithms and how to manipulate search, um, those are foreign to these brands. And when they get bought by large strategics and private equity money, you would think that they have those, you know, have those abilities and have that in there. The problem is a lot of the strategics that buy them are within categories that don't necessarily deal a lot with direct to consumer, um, or they were, or they're kind of late to the game in the sense of like Clorox, like a grocery item type of a, a play. They didn't really have, they now are adding a ton of that. And just the way that like value creation and like kind of the sales cycle or sales creation happens nowadays is, is completely foreign to these legacy brands in terms of how they used to do it before. A lot of the good old boy club, you know, relationships, uh, distribution channels, things like that are not as effective anymore, especially if you don't have these mega brands that have a ton of equity that you can, you know, have a ton of pool off of the shelves at uh, some of these mass retailers and things like that. If you're working in the middle right now and you're not really good at a lot of these things, you know, you're not an A skew or you're not an A brand in these uh, retailers, you're going to kind of fall to the wayside and a lot of this is going to be lost in the bunch. This is just hurting the way that they've always reacted um, in the market comparable to what they need to do today. Last one I want to talk about, number five, is kind of what I mentioned a little bit about bureaucracy with like, these large strategics and kind of how um, things move pretty slow. Organizations, as they kind of mature, they get a little bit bloated. They don't realize that there's brands that are doing you know, 10, 20, $30 million with only a handful of people digitally. Uh, the way that you're building brands nowadays are much different. You, need, you don't need to have a lot of the bloating that you used to have. There's a lot of outsourced or technology that can replace a lot of the bodies that used to be at these companies. And quite honestly, they just can't move fast enough within the market nowadays. The Just the way that they had before with innovation or just kind of changing um, things is very difficult. And not only is it just difficult from a bloat perspective, but you're working with this history that you have to rewrite, which is tough to do. You have to really understand how to play that up within the consumers today. There's always this argument around like, is it actually better to just be a younger company today than it is an older company? And that's a tough question to answer because, you know, on one hand, these legacy brands have all the resources in the world to be able to do the same things that these small startups do. But the small startups are just younger, hungrier, have less of a, um, less kind of hurdles in terms of the market. People don't really know who they are, so they could kind of be anything out there. They can target uh, people and, and it's, you know, and it's well accepted where you have legacy brands where they're kind of just stuck history that's kind of holding them back. And this kind of quicksand or whatever you want to kind of call it to that that's holding them back, even if they're able to get out of it, the question that I have a lot of times is like, will the market think it's authentic to the changes they're making? Like, 
if one of these brands think, hey, there's a really good proposition with keto or one of these emerging trends or, you know, they're going to completely reinvent, like, will the market think it's authentic? Will they accept this? Are they able to tell a story that is accepted by the market? That's kind of questions that needs to be kind of considered with any of these legacy brands if they're trying to dig out of their hole that they're kind of in right now. In the article, I think I wrote like eight names of legacy brands and just kind of threw them together. But um, two of those names were on that list, uh, the champion and, and EAS. They're both obviously gone. Um, I won't speak to the other six that were on that list. There's a few of them that are doing some good things, um, specifically like Labrata. Um, I really like a lot of the, the focus that they're putting on their protein beverages. I think that's a little bit of a competitive advantage in terms of um, in, in terms of the rest of the market, just because the RTD protein market is not all that saturated and they're kind of a long-standing um, long-standing positive brand equity name in that in that list. A few other people on that list are a little bit lost right now and a couple of them that are probably on life support, but you guys can take a look at that. I'll make sure that I link that article. I'll make sure I link that article down below in the description. I think I'll end this topic here. Hopefully you guys got some value out of this video. If you guys did, so ask you guys one more time to hit that thumbs up button. It's right down below. It helps me understand that you guys got some value out of this video. Also helps YouTube understand the same thing. They'll spread this out. It'll help me. If you guys are first time watchers or you guys have not done this so far, make sure you guys hit the subscribe button. I'd love to have you guys a part of my community. But just want to thank you guys one last time for spending some time with me. I hope I gave you guys value in return for the time that you guys gave me. But I'll see you guys on the next video.